the bigger your carbon dioxide footprint, there's no such thing as a carbon footprint, that's nonsense. The bigger your carbon dioxide footprint, the better for the planet. Why? Because carbon dioxide is the gas of life. It's the basis for the whole food chain and emitting more of it greens the planet. There is a meeting in Paris. It's self-evident from the media coverage that there is a huge amount of political and other effort going in to uh, making that meeting a success. Now, in the eyes of the people holding the meeting, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, success involves um, implementing an international tax on emissions of carbon dioxide. And the logic behind that is that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, which it is, and human activities puts extra carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which we do. It's only a small extra amount, but it is extra. And the fear is that that will cause dangerous global warming. There is not a, after 20 years of intense investigation, there is not a shred of positive evidence that human carbon dioxide emissions cause or will cause dangerous global warming. Uh, methane is, is a trace gas in the parts per billion level. It's, it's a several orders of magnitude less than carbon dioxide, so it's, it's just too, too rare a trace gas. That's not to say it's not a greenhouse gas, it is, but it's such a small amount of the atmosphere, it's a very small signal. Uh, carbon dioxide fitted the bill because it looked, you know, we measure it in parts per million, and before the indus Industrial Revolution, the, the natural level was about 280 parts per million. Now, after 100 years or so of industrial activity, it's now up to 400 parts per million. So that's quite a big increase, but an increase in a very small number is still a very small number. However, at several hundred parts per million, carbon dioxide is something you can plug into a model to calculate the heat transfer through the atmosphere and so on, uh, and you can turn that into a plausible story that, that, well, certainly it will cause extra warming, prima facie, but their claim is it will cause dangerous extra warming. Um, that's hotly disputed, and, and I would say the science is simply not there to, to show that. One of the extraordinary things that people, many people, I guess they call left or whatever, progressives, whatever they call them, are worried about their carbon footprint. What do you think about that sort of concern? Well, I, when I give a talk, I normally sometimes, a few minutes to talk, pick a member of the audience, having talked about this carbon dioxide issue, and, and I say, of course, the guy that gets the blame is this fellow here that bought a second SUV last week. And then I let it run for five minutes or so, and I'll, the moment will come when I say, and now what I want you all to do, like this guy here, is go out and buy a third SUV, because the bigger your carbon dioxide footprint, there's no such thing as a carbon footprint, that's nonsense, mm. the bigger your carbon dioxide footprint, the better for the planet. Why? Because carbon dioxide is the gas of life. It's the basis for the whole food chain, and emitting more of it greens the planet. We can actually measure that, and in the last 20 or 30 years, there's about a 13% increase in vegetation, including in places like the Sahel Belt, the semi-arid desert south of the Sahara Desert, has all greened, and part of that greening is due to the natural fertilization of the gentleman in the audience that bought two SUVs. Good on you. The effect of this f false notion on the minds of children and the whole process of, of essentially dumbing down or, or worse, uh, violating their ability to understand and do science. What well, you probably heard Senator Inhofe's um, speech this morning where he referred to an experience we have all had, which is one of his grandchildren coming home from school and saying to him, Grandpa, why don't you understand global warming? And so you are absolutely right that children are being indoctrinated starting at this height from kindergarten through primary school to secondary school through to university. And uh, it's not just global warming, uh, there's a whole bunch of environmental issues where children in school these days do not receive an education, they receive an indoctrination. And, and is this, uh, this uh, dumbing down or changing or affecting science, is this happening well beyond, say, climatology and geology? It is, and it is but my main focus is in the, uh, in, mm -hmm. in the climate change area. Um, but yes, it, it's, it's widespread. However, in the United States, as you'd 
be aware, this is a particularly sensitive issue. We go back to the Darwin uh, scope trial and so on. Um, there is a long tradition in the United States of fierce independence of local school boards or state school boards and their determination that their children will be taught the philosophy they want them to be taught. And lots of Americans and other Western citizens don't see science as an objective background philosophy that is common to all. They actually see it as, a, as something with a message. And if the message is evolution and they don't like that, then they don't want their children exposed to that. It's probably one of the most complex areas in the whole of society, the degree to which politicians should go along with that. To what degree does the education of the parent, of the child, belong as of right to the parent? And to what degree does the state have a position in loco parentis, responsible for the education of that child as well as the parent? It's, it's an incredibly difficult issue. And you spoke earlier of uh, the... Uh, let me see, I forgot my question. Uh, oh, yeah. The tremendous power that uh, the, the environmentalist so-called movement has had. But isn't that essentially the power of the media that allows... Yeah, well, it, it's, it's additive. So the, the, the problem comes from green activism. And it wouldn't get very far if there weren't sympathetic liberal media voices. And if you look around the world, I'm guessing, but it's probably something like 80% of the media are strongly biased to those, in American terms, liberal causes. In Australia, we would call them left-wing causes or even communist causes. Um, so although there are media, small percentage of media, that present the other side of the story, there's no doubt the dominant voice is the voice of the liberal left media. And that has a huge impact on society. Uh, the phenomenon of geoengineering and its effect on the whether there is temperature rise or decrease, uh, can you comment on, on the geoengineering aspect? Not really. I'm a geologist and, and that's a little bit out of my bailiwick. I would say, however, that before you can geoengineer anything, you have to be certain that you understand how it works. We are a huge way away from understanding how climate works. Mm -hmm. Any geoengineering, in my view, has every bit as much chance of rebounding and doing damage as of doing the intended good that you think you're going to do. And, but, and when you're talking about uh, geoengineering, are you factoring in also aerosol spraying? Yeah, and, and, and anything. I mean, it's beyond doubt that human activity has an impact on the environment and has an impact on local climate. Nobody doubts that. If you, um, you build a town or a city in an area where there was uh, native bush before, you cut down the vegetation and you replace dark native vegetation with concrete, glass, macadam and steel. All of those man-made materials trap the sun's rays during the day more than the native vegetation did and then re-radiates that heat at night. So you create what's called an urban heat island effect. No problem. So locally, humans cause warming. Equally, out in the countryside, the wheat farmers cut down the native vegetation and they replace that dark vegetation with light-coloured wheat. What that does is it reflects more of the sun's rays back to space than did the dark vegetation that was there before, and that causes local cooling. OK, so it's a no-brainer. In some areas, mankind has a warming effect. In other areas, mankind has a cooling effect. Even an Australian can understand that that means there must be a global signal when you add up all those little bits. So nobody doubts that humans have an impact on global climate. The question is, what is the magnitude of that signal? And astonishingly, what is the sign of that signal? We've spent several hundred billion dollars since the formation of the IPCC in 1988, several hundred billion dollars trying to detect that human signal and we can't do it. So you think it's a simple matter to add up all these little warmings and coolings around the globe, and yet no, it's not. It's an incredibly complicated thing to do. Nobody's managed to do it, and the net result is, all we know is that there is a signal in there. It's running in the noise of the natural variation of the data, and nobody knows even whether the signal's a gentle warming or a gentle cooling. We don't know that. Lots of scientists will give you good reasons as to why I think it's warming, and there'll be sensible, solid scientists and sensible, solid reasons. But it can't be measured. And until it can be measured, it remains a hypothesis. We don't know. It seems to me that 
the uh, powers that be are using aerosol spraying or chemtrails to affect the climate one way or the other. Now, are you cognizant of that no. phenomenon? No. Okay. All right. Well, Karen, anything else? Oh, well, why do you say that? Well, because we have constant... We have they, the uh, American government is in the process of announcing, and they announced it a little bit in Peru because we had a friend who was there, and uh, they're going to mitigate the climate by spraying and reflecting the sun back, and then the planet will be cool. And that's the argument they make. Oh, that's geoengineering. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's yeah. There's there's scientific papers on that. But I mean, um, it's uh, well. First of all, you've got aluminum and barium mm, and strontium, mm, and those mm, are dripping down. Mm, and you, I mean, these are not normal chemtrails. Yeah, well, as I say, this, it, geoengineering is highly dangerous because we don't understand the system, and it presumes we have a problem. Nobody's demonstrated yeah, right. we have a problem. That's right. It presumes, but that's what scares me the most. They're presuming this problem and giving us a solution. And and if you look at the sky in America, yeah, but at the level, I mean, John Holdren has a brilliant IQ to has a brilliant mind. He's had a brilliant career in science. But at the level of acting as advisor to the president and the president and his cabinet and other advisors, they are not at the level of kindergarten children in their understanding. He's pushing. Of, the, yeah, of course. He's pushing chemtrails. Yeah, yeah, but you have to understand how ignorant they are. It's really a well-educated 12-year-old child knows more than the president on this. How about the uh, albedo effect of, of uh, aerosol spraying and chemtrails, for example? What kind of effect is that having? To, to get to the wheat field to be reflected, it's first got to pass through the atmosphere, and if the atmosphere is full of aerosols, then some of that's going to get bounced back. But it's very complicated. There are more than 42 types of aerosols, more than 40 types of aerosols, of differing um, colours, basically. And depending upon the colour of the aerosol, it will either absorb the heat or bounce it back. So it's very complicated, and as is usual in this field, the numbers that you are given, the story you are told, is based not on measurements but on a computer model. My name is Bob Carter. I am a geologist from Townsville, Australia. The main part of my career has been spent at two universities, Otago University in Dunedin, New Zealand, and James Cook University in Townsville, North Queensland. I'm retired, but I'm currently an Emeritus Fellow of the Institute for Public Affairs, a libertarian, in fact, the world's oldest libertarian think tank uh, based in Melbourne, Australia. Geoengineering is highly dangerous because we don't understand the system and it presumes we have a problem. Nobody's demonstrated yeah, right. we have a problem. 